Foster care programs are supposed to take children away from conditions of abuse or neglect and help them grow up in a normal, productive way. That's why it's doubly tragic when the state, which becomes the child's parent, fails in its duty. This is David R. Jones, president of the Community Service Society, an organization that addresses issues affecting the poor in New York City. Today's urban agenda focuses on what happens to foster care youngsters when they age out of governmental programs. Our guests are Edith Holzer, Director of Public Information for the Council of Family and Child Caring Agencies, an umbrella group for not-for-profit child and family service agencies, Keith Hefner, Executive Director of Youth Communications, and Giselle John, a teenager who is in the foster care system now. Welcome to you all. Edith, you want to give us sort of a, a, the lay of the land? What's happening? How many kids are in foster care now? Well, there are, there are 43,000 children in foster care in New York City. Of, that, of the 43,000, about 10% uh, are between the ages of 14 and 21. And that's the aging out period? Um, for, at the age of 14, young people are expected to get independent living services, which means preparation to go out on their own if those young people are not expected to return home. Um, the social services regulations that were put in place about 10 years ago call for career counseling, um, helping young people with, with their education, tutoring, remedial services when necessary, um, helping them learn to budget, to balance a checkbook, to find an apartment a lot of very specific services geared toward helping those young people reach self-sufficiency. Right. There are a lot of intangibles, however, that aren't, can't be regulated, that young people need. And are we talking about a large number of kids? I mean, what, uh, there, are about, there are about 5,000 children actually receiving independent living services. I see. And, and we talk about the demo demographics, or is this largely African-American and Latino kids or well, you in New York City? You'd have to look at the uh, percentage of uh, each ethnic group represented in the foster care system, and it's about 56% African-American, 20% Hispanic, 20% unknown, which could mean multiracial. Right. Nobody's really defined that. About 2% white, and then there's a category of other that nobody really knows what that stands for. And, and what is your overall understanding of how successful this process is? Are these kids doing very well when they get out? It's very much a matter of concern to people who work in foster care and who work with young people. And there are not really exit statistics that we can look at. There are some programs, like one agency in Westchester called Children's Village has run a special program called the Way Program. Where mean they, these kids aren't tracked after they age out? We don't know what happens? They no, just fall off the earth? No. Um, it depends on when they leave. If they leave at the age of 21, which means the end of all services, then there probably isn't that much tracking, but there's probably informal communication between the young person and either the foster family or the, uh, the agency program that they were with. If they leave between 18 and 21, then there's a discharge period that is formal where there's um, contact, consistent contact between the agency and the young person, and no young person is supposed to leave without guarantee of stable housing for But we have no statistics year. really to, to back this up across the system. No, we really don't. Interesting. Yeah, let me add yeah. something on that. that it's, I mean, you, you expressed a little alarm that yeah. there isn't tracking, and I, it, it's even more alarming to me than, than the tone in your right. voice, and here's why. I've, and you know this as well, there, there are very few studies of any kind, academic or city or state done or anything, tracking kids who have left foster, uh, foster care. It's a handful. In, in the last 20 years. Right. And what's really extraordinary about that is that the state has taken the role of the parent of these children. Right. And it's, it, it is as if a parent, when the child turned 18 or 19 or 20, just slammed down the steel gate and said, we, you don't exist anymore right. for us. That's the effect of not tracking. Aside from all the data that we don't have about what's going on with these kids, it means that, in a sense, that person who has said, you can't live with your parents, in fact, we're going to as the state, we're going to go and take you away from your parents. 
a, a, a major, the most major intervention you can imagine. And then when you're turned 21, it's like, oh, it didn't happen. You're gone. You don't exist anymore. Well, I know when I was in the head of youth services for the city of New York in the 80s, uh, when we sat down and realized that we were asking a 17 and 18 year old to do what none of us could do as adults. We basically had a whole range of supports. <laughs> you know, learning the subway is what most 16 and 17 year olds are doing as opposed to setting up a household. Well, Giselle, what's happening? You're, you're in the midst of this transition. What's it been like? Well, for me, it's, uh, I have a lot of questions, but I guess my background, my parents, my foster parents have right. been really good to me. They've taught me a lot. Um, even though I didn't live with my biological parents f for years, right. the, the training that I got from my mother is still in me. I still know how to look for a job because I go to my independent living skills. Right. We have it. Um, my foster mother teach me how to keep the house clean, how yeah. to do things, how to, you know, if she's not away, I can keep the house for her, in other words. Um, a lot of kids don't have that training. Right. And as a teenager in the system, it's difficult when you don't have someone who can say, we don't want you to hold our hands. It's not hold my hands. It's just show me. And, you know, a lot of, per a lot of adults don't realize that it takes a, lo a period for us to really get over it because when you leave foster care it is difficult I am so scared but I'm now I'm not depending on the system I'm doing things to myself I've always been and I always will because at 21 when they give me that 750 and said bye bye you know it was nice knowing you don't want to see well, it don't. I don't know if many of our viewers know what is the $750 you're talking about <laughs> it's the, what you call the discharge grant they give you that when you leave the system you know Th that's it that's it. What do you expect? In the house and land? <laughs> no. Nah. They give you that much, and it's just nice to know you. We had you. If you ain't care for 13 years, it was nice. It's almost as if they're saying to you, well, you know what, Giselle, you know, 13 years was not long enough with you. Bye-bye. Here's your money. Go find That's yourself it. a house and land. Can I ask you yeah. something? Do you think, though, that you'll continue to keep in contact with your foster parents? Definitely. Right. Yeah. Because they that have been a, very a major difference. part of my training. Right. You know. Now, many kids, however, when they reach this period, 14 or up, don't have an actual foster parent. They have an agency they're dealing with. Isn't that true? It's about 60-40. 60 percent of the kids receiving independent living are in group care. 40 percent are living with foster families. And how is the group care, how do they track out? In it could either be a group home. Well, actually, when you think about delivering for independent living services, it's easier in a group home because you have a captive audience. Right. Um, but it's not warm and fuzzy when you have after 21 you have to call back to your group home for help. It's, it really varies. There are young people who develop very close relationships with a social worker, with a child care worker, and there are mentoring relationships that are very important for young people. Let's, so let's talk about it doesn't work. There, there have been some uh, data that I've seen showing a really high proportion of kids who are coming out of foster care who end up on welfare in the criminal justice system and in other systems. Do we have any data even on that? Um, I think we're looking at it from the other end. So you can look at the criminal justice system and the homeless population, and yes, you're going to see foster care kids disproportionately represented because these are kids who've had disrupted early lives. And most of the people, unfortunately, who have difficulty in life have had disruptions. I, I guess I'm concerned when I was youth service commissioner, uh, a group from Israel came over. Uh, talking about what was their foster care system for kids who lost their parents during the Holocaust. They turned out to have the highest scores and the highest attendance in colleges of any group in Israel. And basically when we talked about it, why couldn't we do that, this was an investment issue. It was clear that the state is not invested, $750, mm -hmm. I assure you, if these were children who were not of color and were considered vital to the society, that wouldn't happen. I don't know, I'm, I'm arguing now, but I'm, I'm concerned that we're sort of watching a system that's already discarded children I, I in their treatment. Well, you're making some very important points, and actually when you say the state, the change in administrations has had a very negative impact on kids receiving independent living services. At the tail end of the Cuomo administration, there was a... Uh, a definite focus on helping kids who are in independent living. There was actually a woman who was setting up focus groups around the state. We were really moving toward some kind of uniform programs and, and greater resources. And then last year we had a, uh, a frightening proposal by the governor to end, foster, uh, to end foster care services before age 21 unless 
a young person was still finishing high school or going into adult custodial care? Well, you know, in, in uh, my agency, the Community Service Society, is 150 years old, and I occasionally go through the archival material. At one point, foster care, uh, correct, it didn't sort of make a transition. They put kids after a certain age directly in prison. They didn't skip. This was the turn of the century. They basically, after you reached a certain age and hadn't, you know, been adopted or found work, you were put directly into, into the criminal justice system. And I'm wondering, in a backdoor way, are we starting to lay some of the same groundwork? Well, okay. this issue of the investment and what does it take to help somebody make a transition, I think there's an, an earlier issue to look at as right. well, which is that kids don't go into foster care in most cases because of an act of God, of a parent dying or something like that. They go in, in my opinion, because of an unwillingness to invest initially in their families. Most kids who go into foster care have parents who are, have drug problems or, well that, that's by far the biggest issue, but, and, and, and are very poor. Mm -hmm. And if the society, if we were willing to invest in those families earlier with substance abuse treatment and you know, a whole range of policies to address policy, far fewer of these kids would go in in the first place, which to me, that, that's, a, that's a big problem. But let's just say that, that, that exists. That raises, in a way, the moral obligation. Once you've said, well, we're not willing to invest in your parents, but we're going to take you out, mm -hmm. at least these kids should deserve a major investment, as I suspect the kids in Israel were getting. But we're not doing that. We're, we're penalizing the kids at both, the, well. the families at one end and the kids at the other end. Well, is there any kind of scholarship program, at least for higher education? Yes. Yeah. For, and for kids who come out of Different care? agencies offer scholarships. But there's no blanket program. No, see, that's, that's the heartbreaking thing, is that very often a child's opportunities are limited to where they were placed. Where they, they, and that can be luck. Yes, exactly, exactly. And there are kids who are going to college, um, and there are kids who are doing better because they had the fortune to meet the right people. Well, what are your career plans, Giselle? Where, well, where do you want to go? What do you want to do now? I'd like to go. I'd like to be a lawyer, number one. So, okay. um, a major part is because I am in foster care, and I'd like to advocate for young people mm -hmm. in foster care because my experiences in foster care haven't been as bad as a lot of other young people, but it hurts my heart when I see young people suffer yes. because I see that they don't know how to stand up for themselves. You know, a lot of times the agencies don't provide some of this stuff and they don't provide information, a lot of them. And then those who provide it, well, we have those kids who don't want to hear it because they're not aging out as yet. They're 14 and aging out is how much years away, so it's like I learned that when I'm 19. I'm 19 and I'm scared as hell to get out of this system. I don't want to stay in it, but I want to be standing on my own two feet. I want to go to college, go to law school, become the lawyer that I want to go to. And while I'm doing that, I also want to advocate for young people, especially in first care. I'm not just saying only, but young people in general because we don't have that support that we really should be getting. Right. You know? it, it doesn't seem to make sense also. The whole idea, welfare reform and everything else, is an attempt to make it easy for people to go from dependency to work. And they don't seem to be that kind of across the board effort being made to, to make pe sure people can prepare for career or, or even work you know, going on. I got a call from someone who's looking at this nationally to see what the impact of welfare reform will be on young people because one of the most difficult areas is finding housing and finding employment and what's going to happen if you don't even have that boost of getting welfare when you get out. Right. Now, when someone hits this age, are, uh, do agencies send them right over to welfare if they don't have a job? It depends. If, if they're 21 and they're leaving care and they don't have a job, yes, I would say that the most responsible thing would be for that young person to have some income. Um, as I said, if they're under 21, somewhere between 18 and 21, then they can remain in care till 21. If they're discharged early, they must have a place to live that's not temporary, that has to be at and least a year's And how can they work place. that with $750? Well, there are, a lot, there are other resources, okay. and hopefully you're a wonderful example of a young person who's advocating for yourself. Right. And hopefully if you have a combination of a young person advocating for themselves or somebody advocating for them, you have um, what's called a housing subsidy, which is a $300 a month subsidy that was put in place, and our organization was one of the uh, 
proposal proponents of this to subsidize rents for right. either children returning home from foster care or to avert foster care placement. Right. Unfortunately, only a handful of kids in independent living services actually get that subsidy. Another useful um, help for young people needing an apartment was Jiggets. Unfortunately, again, that was connected to welfare. That's right. been ended. So we're looking at some grim outcomes because of the loss of subsidies that had existed. Uh, in terms of employment, there are um, employment counseling. There's employment counseling that goes on within some of the programs. <coughs> then there are also outreach groups that do uh, job training. By and large, how are, how, what's the educational attainment of most of the kids you're seeing in well, programs? You're, where, where are they at? Are most of them it's, high school graduates? It's very mixed. No. And one of the frightening things is that this, the whole foster care system is going to go through a uh, reorganization through new requests for proposals. And the commissioner of uh, the Administration for Children's Services, Nicholas <coughs> Cepeda, has put out a request for information prior to releasing the RFP. In the area of independent living services, there are some very ambitious um, proposals which are very needed. Mm -hmm. But in education, what they're looking for is attainment of an eighth grade education. So that gives you an idea of where the educational um, levels exist now. If that's going to be we, we just, uh, across the board uh, released expectation. A re uh, one of their first reports, uh, CSS did, on the job picture for New York City. And while uh, we have uh, had a drop in unemployment in New York, it's about 9.1 percent, for low-wage workers with high school or less, certainly eighth grade, uh, the market has, is oversaturated, even today, with all the things. Th you can't be a software developer, as one of the papers recently reported, uh, with an eighth grade ed education. And there's real fear that not only is uh, the 9.1 uh, unemployment not reflective of the real situation for people who haven't attained high school, uh, but it's, it's, it's tremendously worse. And to make that the standard is going to make sure that uh, we're going to have taxpayers uh, taking care of welfare and other sort of ancillary costs, not to mention the damage to these kids for generations. Uh, that They don't seem to get it, though. It, it's so worrisome. It, these are wonderful young kids, and I have a good fortune of meeting kids who come out who, like you, want to help other kids who are still in foster care and work on conferences and run retreats, and they know that there are other young kids who are not getting the resources that they need, and it, these kids need attention, and I think there should be an outright appeal for other people to become mentors and to become involved. Yes, Giselle. Um, with the educational where education is concerned, foster care and the Board of Ed do not have that connection. They don't. We don't. It doesn't matter. It's like you get the runaround in Board of Ed, a serious runaround. You don't get any respect in there. You understand what I'm saying? You get tied up in red tape. And a lot of kids in high schools, in schools anywhere, who are in foster care, go, people, it's like it's skipped over. It's like no additional help or anything. And the first thing they do is put you in special ed. You're in foster care, special ed. Mm -hmm. I've been in high school, and nobody knew I was in foster care. And it wasn't because I was ashamed. I did my work. Right. And I went through high school. I've never been placed in special ed. And I'm glad for that, but I stood up for myself. Right. Nobody would bring the idea to me, tell me that they want to put me in special ed, because I would tell them point blank, there's nothing wrong with me. Right. But young people who don't know how to set up and say, listen, there's nothing wrong with me, you know. I am quite capable of going through regular mainstream. You know, they get placed in foster care and there's it's, no one it's to exactly. I, I think there's a failure to understand. I, I still have vague uh, recollections of being 16 and 17 year old. And in those sort of times, ancient history really, the most you used to do was play stickball and your mother would call you in. And the notion of going into the city from Bedford Stuyvesant where I lived was a major adventure. And suddenly we change the deal here. Suddenly we're expecting 16, 17, and 18 year olds to act like full fledged adults in a very complex time. Well, that's Keith, another, you've been looking at it from, from the, the point of view of youth co communications. What, it, what is the stories that you're hearing here? And, and well, I, that's all right. Here's one story. I've worked with youth communication for 18 years. Right. We have another magazine that's not written 
by kids in foster care. It's kids who are teenagers who are not in foster care. And I've, I'm tracking 800 of those kids. And a very, I don't know what the percentage is, but it surprises me how many of those kids in their mid-20s, late-20s, even early-30s are still living at home because of the housing and job market in New York City. And these are kids, you know, who have jobs paying $30,000 a year in, right. you know, law journals and things like that. But it's still not enough if they want to save any money towards some hopeful future of a family in their own place and stuff for them to go out on their own. So these kids get this kind of support, which, you know, basically we all need. I still call my mother for advice on raising my kids. Mm -hmm. And yet, this group of kids who we have a special obligation to because we've taken them out of their families, we're not willing to do anything past this age 21. And again, it's not unprecedented for us to provide help to people past age 21. I after World War II and for a long time, we gave people serious education subsidies. We helped them buy their houses. We helped through the highway system, you know, fund, subsidize their entire way of life. And yet now we have this group, a relatively small group of people in very desperate circumstances, and we're not willing to go, it seems to me, even the extra mile to give them what they well, need. Well, one of the things that struck me, this is a fixable problem in many respects. This is not the world. Yeah. You've, got a, you've got people who are in care. The government is the parent. You're supposed to be acting like a responsible parent. Mm -hmm. And suddenly we seem to lose our way in terms of oversight. Uh, the fact you're not collecting, we're not collecting data on a systematic uh, method of not creating all sorts of incentive and support programs. The Israeli group who came to me basically had a cradle-to-grave support program. You had an mm -hmm. alumni association mm -hmm. of kids who came out of this particular system. They met two or three times a year. Uh, there was a networking that went on where if one uh, got a position, they'd immediately send out, uh, you know, the uh, asking for resumes from people who were also in it. There was government housing subsidies. There were employment subsidies. There was even a vacation plan. Um, all those things were going, and, and it, it, was, it was sort of terrifying in the exchange because this individual was looking at me as a government official. Why haven't you done this? And mm -hmm. I, my only response was, clearly, the society is not willing to focus resources because these kids are not seen as a priority or even as, as full citizens of the society. So it was a little scary that now, that was in the 80s, we're a longer way down the pike, and we're still confronting, if not the same problem, perhaps even a worse problem. But rather than leaving my audience all, you know, oh my god, another program, how should we go about fixing this? I'll start with you. Well, um, I think one of the points that Keith brought up in that helping families early on would have made a difference, many of these young people do end up going back to live with their yeah, parents right. because there's no place else and hopefully they have better coping mechanisms so that they can live at home but we should still be working with the parents we should not forget about the families even though the young people have a goal of independent living mm -hmm. another um, issue that needs to be addressed is the resource issue as you were saying we should be making sure that young people have the educational opportunities that they are supposed to be getting well, we were talking earlier that even uh, paying for CUNY uh, mm -hmm. uh, education isn't subsidized for a kid in foster care other than his room and board. Yeah, and, and room and board is not an issue with CUNY. So that uh, so it's basically really the fee. Where does the fee come from then for, for staying in CUNY? They just raise the rates. I'm, I assume that's waived for I somebody think, in state control. Isn't yeah, it? I think um, at least when a, a young person is in an agency, that they're able to identify certain funding. But the to agency help the young has, this is not, the government doesn't help. Well, it would be out of the uh, government funding. It was some way of doing an exception to policy. Unfortunately, an there's to policy. so <laughs> much bureaucracy <laughs> governing the foster care totally. and foster care expenditures totally. that, that makes yeah. it very difficult. Keith, how would you fix it? As you said, again, I think a lot more needs to be done earlier with families to prevent kids from going in. I think that, again, something like 80 or 90 percent of the kids have contact with families even after they age out. And too often in the system we act as if those families don't exist and that is going to be the long-term support of the kids and those parents need to be involved earlier on in the whole independent living process and in family therapy and other kinds right. of things. I also think that there, there should be some kind of entitlement, like a child has in a regular family, that goes up to age 25 or some point at which the average person 
then really feels independent. And I don't see any reason why when we've taken these kids away from their families, we don't owe them that at least. Giselle, how would you fix it? Well, what is this? Uh, well, me, I'm telling you what I'm doing personally okay. is that I am doing things on my own. When I get out of foster care, I do not have that family to go back to. Yeah. This is Giselle hitting the road, getting, standing up on her own. By God's grace, I'm going to be able to do it. My support, my family is my church. That's mm -hmm. it. Now, you know a lot of young people don't have that. Right. So that is a lot for a whole bunch of, a great, a lot, on a larger scale, a lot of young people don't have that support. Right? For me, what I say, ACS, <laughs> you know they say too much, uh -huh, too much cook spoiled the pot? That's what happens in ACS, you know. After a while, you start running around like a chicken without a head. That's what's going on. But right. they're improving. They are. They're improving yeah. gradually. It's just that on the board, what you need, what I see, is the need for young people in care come together as a committee, as a committee. Because we're the only ones who can tell you right. the effect of foster care. Come together as a, commu as a committee. We're a commissioner scapetta sits down and talks to them face to face, not through his big man, not through his deputy commissioner, not through his secretary. He comes and, and talks to us. And young people will be able, that's, that's what okay. I see. You're going to be a great lawyer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I know. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> Many social problems defy solutions because millions of people are involved. But the foster care problem is one of small scale and one we can easily resolve. The 2,000 or so youngsters who age out each year need more than $750 stipend and a handshake. They need career counseling, training for jobs, assistance with child care where needed, information on obtaining housing and health care, and guidance to make the transition to independent living. Otherwise, all too many wind up on the streets, in jail, or on welfare. Far more costly alternatives for the society and a tragic waste of human potential. This is David R. Jones. Thank you for joining me on the Urban Agenda. To comment on the Urban Agenda or for more information on CSS, contact Community Service Society of New York, 105 East 22nd Street, New York, New York, 10010, area code 212-254-8900.